We often talk on this channel about the men and women who write music, composers who innovate and move history forward in some way. What we don't talk about so often is exactly how these people made money and the changes to this system over time. Up to the classical era, funding came through the royal courts or the church, and with Beethoven onwards, with the decline of these positions, composers found ways to piece together incomes by writing music for a number of different patrons on commission, as well as in teaching private lessons. Academic positions in conservatories and later the music departments of liberal arts schools provided another path, although always in limited quantities. We have not quite moved past the Beethovenian model of commissions and teaching. Ultimately, the money that funds classical music has to come from somewhere. So today, I thought we'd do something a little bit different and tell the story of music in the early 20th century by looking not at an innovative composer or a virtuoso performer, but through one of the most prolific patrons of classical music of her time, a woman who did as much to shape the direction of music as anyone else. Because at the end of the day, money talks. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge. Elizabeth Penn Sprague, Lizzie to her family, was born in late October 1864 in Chicago, Illinois, an unusual birthplace considering both sides of her family had roots in New England. Her father Albert, seeing fortune to be made in a country that was becoming more and more connected by rail, went into business in the Windy City with his brother-in-law and a family friend. Chicago turned into the wholesale capital of the United States. Railroads revolutionized the speed of shipping goods across the country, and Chicago's population grew by close to a thousand percent in the 30 years after the Civil War, surpassing Philadelphia as the nation's second largest city. Not even the fire of 1871 could put an end to Albert's entrepreneurship. As he grew his business into one of the country's top grocery providers, the family never lost sight of their Puritan roots and they sought to find ways of using their wealth and their newfound fame to make a positive impact in the world. The late 19th century, which came to be known as the Gilded Age for its domination by oligarchic titans of industry, saw the rise of these ultra-wealthy robber barons, men like Andrew Carnegie, who was born the same year as Albert, and in attempts to rehabilitate their public image and do something with their ungodly fortunes, they gave of their wealth to charitable causes. As a result, we think of Carnegie Hall, or Carnegie Mellon, or the Carnegie Library, not, you know, massive labor violations. The fortune of Sprague, Warner, and company was not as massive as the biggest names of that era, but in terms of class and status, the same pressures applied. When we speak of Elizabeth's later patronage, it has to be stressed that she did not have the effectively limitless cash that we would see from the era's top magnates. Her ability to make people think that she was very, very, very rich came from her judicious spending habits, and mostly staying out of the public eye. Lizzie had two younger sisters, but as was all too common in an era before modern medicine, measles, tuberculosis, and scarlet fever conspired to leave only Lizzie. With her father doing well in the food distribution business, the family had plenty of disposable income to make sure that their daughter was very well trained in music, as all young ladies were at the time. Women's role in music has always been complicated and circumscribed in various ways. With the rise of the middle class, pianos were in any home that could afford one. And the piano was an acceptably feminine instrument, and was considered an important part of a young lady's finishing education. Her teacher, Regina Watson, was a grand student of the mighty Franz Liszt, and knew most of the big names in his neck of the woods over in Europe. Like many, though, she abandoned her nascent performing career for teaching, and eventually landed in the south side of Chicago. As Lizzie advanced in her lessons, Albert used his capital to further Chicago's cultural prestige. In the mid-1880s, he headed up a smash hit opera festival that put on 14 different productions in a mere 12 days. I'm not going to ask how they did that. I will note, though, this was before they took out the cocaine and soft drinks. Lizzie and her mother, who went by Nan, had a close but complicated relationship, exacerbated by the deaths of her siblings. 
She was sent off to a boarding school in Manhattan for a time. Mrs. Reed's was nominally a finishing school, but you know, in addition to all that etiquette nonsense, they had a strong emphasis on music and languages. The school just wasn't a good fit, ultimately. Elizabeth felt constrained. She never had spent that much time around people her own age, and now she was doing so in a strict and controlling environment where chaperones were a dime a dozen. And Nan missed her daughter. Elizabeth, who was, as you might have gathered by this point, pretty intelligent, always regretted not having gone on and gotten a college education. But if she had, she might not have met the love of her life. Elizabeth played piano duets with the feisty Frances Fanny Glessner, and the Glessner's fortune was all in farm equipment, and all the newly rich families of Chicago seemed to know one another. Elizabeth was with the Glessners at their summer home in New Hampshire, when their family friends, the Coolidges, came to town. Elizabeth became close friends with Isa Coolidge, and in the summer of 1889, her brother, a medical student named Frederick, fell madly in love with Elizabeth. When she visited Boston that winter and was snowed in for her trouble, Frederick hatched a plan. He took the train back with her as far as Pittsfield in western Massachusetts, rented a sleigh, and proposed in a sleigh ride. Elizabeth was caught between a rock and a hard spot. She was the daughter of a wealthy family. The Sprague's had shot up into the social stratosphere during her lifetime. And as much as she admired the women around her who had careers and likely harbored a desire to emulate them, it would have been a social outrage for a woman of her class to work like that. How could she remain active and engaged in the arts while not incurring the misogynistic wrath of Gilded Age society? And Fred, well, he wasn't the type to make waves. He tiptoed around the complicated family politics. He took great pains to conceal their engagement so as not to affect the friendship between his fiancée and his sister or the relationship between his fiancée and her mother. After years of negotiating the delicate situation, Elizabeth and Frederick finally married in November 1891 in a ceremony officiated by Albert's old friend, the Reverend Joseph Twitchell. For all her wealth and status, Elizabeth was confined by her society. They expected her to be a homemaker and a mother first and foremost, regardless of her class. And as she came to accept the inevitability of her passivity, she fell into fits of depression and despair in what should have been the Coolidge's honeymoon period. She wanted to be a concert pianist, something like a Clara Schumann type, who could balance the demands of motherhood with an artistically fulfilling touring schedule. She got a couple of tastes of this life, one of which was in playing Clara's husband's Robert's piano concerto in July 1893 when the World Columbian Exposition came to Chicago. The city grew by leaps and bounds, culturally as well as economically. The two couldn't be divested. The new rich of Chicago invested in the arts. They wanted their orchestra to be world class. Death and illness haunted the family. Their son, Albert Sprague, who went by his middle name, was the only bright spot in the family where caretaking duties seemed to always fall on Nan's shoulders. Fred suffered from an unknown illness that nearly killed him, and Elizabeth herself, who was never blessed with a strong immune system, began to lose her hearing. When and where she could, she threw herself into her scholarship, putting in long hours at the library to make up for her lack of college education. For her son, she wrote a collection of pieces called the After Supper Songs, written to her own texts and interspersed with her own illustrations. It was the culmination of all of her artistic interests up until that point. Her friend's enthusiasm for the publication gave her the courage to send a copy to one of the biggest names in American music of the time, Amy Beach, who was also an encouraging voice, and they continued to correspond. Coolidge would send pieces, and Beach would lightly critique them while always encouraging her to keep on developing her talents. Her most ambitious work was a leitmotif-laden song cycle of settings of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's poetry, written as an anniversary present to Fred who was growing sicker and sicker. The culprit was syphilis. 
He had contracted it while operating on a patient with the disease in 1895. Then he got tuberculosis, which was then also incurable. Physicians had made some strides in alleviating the symptoms and helping patients live longer lives through setting up sanitariums in secluded mountainous regions like Saranac Lake in New York's Adirondack region, where the Coolidge's went so Fred wouldn't have to go through treatment alone. Fred improved, and he did the doctor's advice that going back to heavily polluted Chicago probably was not a great move for his beat-up lungs, so likely thinking back to their engagement, they moved to Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Elizabeth made the best of a bad situation, and in western Massachusetts, she took advantage of the musical resources across the state. Locally, she got to know the larger-than-life figure of Gertrude Watson, a pianist who had done some touring in her time but now was just mostly devoted to music in her local community. The two would be lifelong friends. Boston was a train ride away, so she invited members of the Boston Symphony out to play chamber music concerts with herself on the piano. It was a dim version of the life she had once dreamed for herself. Her ambitions to write symphonies and paint and be a mother to a large family were, by circumstances far outside of her control, completely unattainable. Their sprawling Pittsfield house, well over two dozen rooms, was called Upway Fields and was designed by one of her in-laws to be a perfect space for music and entertainment. But once again, as soon as they put down roots, those roots were pulled up again. A brush with death in the winter of 1906-1907 to 1907 left Fred hospitalized in Boston, half-deaf, beginning to lose his mind as a result of tertiary syphilis. Fred would often recover just enough to want to resume his orthopedic practice, whether or not it was a good idea. Elizabeth learned that Daniel Gregory Mason was summering in Pittsfield, which would give her time to study composition while staying pretty close to home. But her longest composition teacher was Percy Getchius, who found her to be far too distrustful of her own talents and instincts. She had to have her lessons with him surreptitiously while in New York, because he was contractually forbidden from teaching students outside the auspices of the Institute of Musical Art, a precursor of Juilliard. Her combination of advanced autodidactic study and lack of confidence in her own abilities made her an interesting pedagogical case study. She was gearing up for a string quartet, arguably as autobiographical as her Browning cycle. All the while, Fred's condition worsened. Strokes paralyzed his body piece by piece as the syphilis further invaded his brain. Upway Fields was a huge burden for Elizabeth. It was expensive to maintain and only served as a reminder of what once briefly was a pleasant domesticity. Albert, who had tirelessly given of himself and his wealth to support many sick family members, died in early 1915. His grocery supply empire made, in today's money, close to a half billion dollars a year. His personal estate was close to $123 million today. Elizabeth took her cut of the inheritance and immediately gave half of it to Albert's beloved Chicago Orchestra, an act of visible philanthropy that had a number of knock-on effects. Frederick Stock, the conductor of the orchestra, was immensely grateful and offered to program an arrangement of some of her string quartet for string orchestra, and was so taken with her talent that he tried to get her lessons with his friend Charles Leffler. That the gift was so public inspired the further giving from the wealthy to their local orchestras across the country. Music was her refuge from the agony of loss, first the sudden death of her father, later in the year, the inevitable passing of Fred. In the following year, Elizabeth and Nan would grow closer, repairing a relationship that had long been fraught. But Nan wasn't long for the world either, growing sicker and sicker and dying in March 1916. In the span of 14 months, Elizabeth lost both of her parents and her husband, and her only son entered into what she kind of selfishly considered a hasty marriage. The upshot is that she now came into possession of more money and more houses than she knew what to do with. The buildings largely went to charitable causes, like housing nurses in Chicago. Upway Fields became a home for disabled children. The money went to lots of places, many to causes and to places earmarked by Albert and Nan. She wished for a music hall to be built at Yale, and Elizabeth coordinated with the dean of Yale's fledgling school of music, Horatio Parker, on the design details. Elizabeth 
Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge was a patron of more than just composers. She sprayed her money around all manner of musical, medicinal, and general philanthropic causes, especially when she initially came into vast wealth and was responsible for executing the wishes of her dearly departed parents. As she grew into her new role as a wealthy donor, she honed her giving not just to music, but chamber music specifically. As a medium, it always interested her. It was accessible at home, perhaps she was fond of its intimacy, capable of subtler gestures than the repertoire found in major concert halls. But money in the chamber game was really slim, and required the involvement of wealthy patrons to survive. The Flanzale Quartet, founded in 1902, though not the first homegrown quartet, was one of the early success stories, and it provided a model for an intimately involved patron. Edward de Coppet funded them, sat in as the occasional pianist, and was their coach. And he built such a successful ensemble that they managed to outlive their patron. Coolidge had heard the Flansleys perform while visiting the de Coppets in New York, and so she already had the de Coppet model in mind when Hugo Kortschock, former assistant concertmaster of the Chicago Symphony, quit that job to focus on chamber music, and reached out to Coolidge as a shot in the dark to see if she would subsidize a new quartet venture. Kortschock and Coolidge shared many artistic ideals, and she agreed, thus founding the Berkshire String Quartet, to be based in western Massachusetts in the summers, but otherwise residing in New York City. The three-year contract allowed her to sit in on rehearsals, play with the group if they were going to tackle a piano quintet, and required that they practice and become the very best before playing publicly. Chamber music required the philanthropic efforts of people like Tocopet and Coolidge, because the money in classical music was concentrated in the nation's collection of budding orchestras. Her Berkshire boys, as she called them, were just the tip of the iceberg. Upway Fields was now out of her hands, but she remained attached to Western Massachusetts, and embarked on the construction of what she called her Temple of Music, a simple wooden auditorium with beautiful acoustics. The site and its surrounding bungalows housed her newest venture, the Berkshire Festival, due to start in the fall of 1918. She then announced a chamber music competition. The best string quartet submitted would receive a performance at the festival, and the winning composer would get over $31,000 in today's money. That amount of cash generated a surge of interest in quartet composition across the world. The first competition got 82 entries. Daniel Mason, who had brainstormed extensively with Coolidge about potential avenues of patronage, called the 1918 Berkshire Festival the first chamber music festival ever given in America. The effect of celebrating music of all stripes during a world war that was causing mass death as well as artistic boycotts all across Europe was not lost on those in attendance. Not to mention this was an advancement in American cultural prestige, regardless of what was happening over in Europe. The next competition, focused on the viola, had an even number of adjudicators, resulting in a tie between two of her friends, Ernest Bloch and Rebecca Clark, the violist composer who had, at one point, employed Coolidge's friend Gertrude Watson as a soloist. So as not to show feminine favoritism, Coolidge chose Bloch. Adjudicators for subsequent competitions recounted an increasingly arduous task of sifting through the better part of a hundred manuscripts each time, several rounds, including private sight-reading sessions, and a general decrease in quality over the years. In lieu of a yearly competition, Coolidge began swapping out competition years with commission years, and she began her series of commissions with ones for Eugene Goosens and her once-snubbed friend, Rebecca Clark, who would be the only woman to ever receive a Coolidge commission. While the Berkshire Quartet only lasted for the three years of their contract, splitting up at Coolidge's request due to strife between its members, Kortschock continued a close association with Coolidge. He took over the operations of the Berkshire Music Colony, allowing Coolidge to focus her energies elsewhere. She continued to have a strong hand in the festivals, and word had gotten out about her generous patronage. Although Coolidge is important to the story of American music, most notably her strong support for immigrant composers like Bloch, her patronage activities extended to Europe, notably with connections in England and in Italy. Coolidge comprehended the magnitude of what she was doing for music, American and otherwise, and she sought institutional partnership to make sure that her work could continue. 
Yale wasn't particularly interested, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters found it too big of a job for them to take on. A fortuitous meeting with Bloch's friend Carl Engel, who headed up the music division at the Library of Congress, led to the biggest public-private partnership in the history of American art. Having run into testy political situations of choosing between friends or witnessing the turmoil within a dedicated ensemble, Coolidge was determined to, in her words, impersonalize her work through some institution. The library, for their part, was keen on bringing Coolidge into the fold, and initially were at least a little concerned about scaring her off. They had had several figures who had paved the way for music. Herbert Putnam, who became the librarian of Congress in 1899, inherited an institution without any meaningful organizational system, and got about fixing that. Oscar Sonic, appointed chief of the music division in 1902, found that his job oversaw a collection of copyright deposits organized a mere five years earlier and not much else besides. Putnam and Sonic modernized that which was under their domain, and when Sonic left in fall 1917 for Shermer's music publishing firm, the job eventually fell to his handpicked successor, Carl Engel. Coolidge gave Engel a test run by inviting him to be a composition competition adjudicator, and once she was satisfied that his entreaties to her to bequeath her records to the library were legitimate, she did so. And she sent a quartet and a trio along with the manuscripts, with the idea the library would put on performances, that music would live at the library. Only the library had all of one dilapidated piano that was relegated to the basement, and nothing approaching a proper performance space. The first library-affiliated concerts had to be held at the Smithsonian's Freer Gallery in early February 1924. Most of the repertoire was from Berkshire-affiliated contemporary composers, many of whom were in attendance. The nation's capital had never heard anything like this, to the point that the Washington press barely gave notice that it was even happening. The huge crowd that appeared on the third day must therefore have come about by word of mouth. The concerts characterized Coolidge's relationship to the library. The works that she gave to them would be brought to life, not just be part of their permanent collection sitting on a shelf somewhere. In October 1924, she approached the federal government with an offer to pay for an auditorium for the library and to start a trust fund to publicize its activities. No private citizen in the history of the United States had ever done something like that. The Washington bureaucracy hadn't a single clue of how to handle this. It was the fund that caused the real headaches. But with careful negotiation of arcane government rules, both the gift of the auditorium and the Coolidge Foundation were approved by Congress and signed into law by President Calvin Coolidge. Many assumed that these Coolidges were married, a rumor that Silent Cal didn't care enough about to break, if he knew of those rumors at all. Her friend Frank Bridge got a kick out of sending her clippings from the British press, who assumed all famous American Coolidges were related. Moving the focus of her musical activities to Washington did not leave Pittsfield entirely in the lurch, but it was a larger city by far, with fewer musically literate, proportionally, than a place like Boston or New York. This was reflected in the programming at the new Coolidge Auditorium, which negotiated a larger swath of the musical canon than the focus on modernity in Pittsfield. The Foundation took these programs to major cities around the country and subsidized their broadcast on the radio during their first season. Most ambitious was her funding of radio-broadcasted organ concerts given by E. Power Biggs. When she got letters from happy music lovers who, for whatever reason, were not able to attend live concerts, she recognized this as perhaps her finest achievement in bringing music to the masses. As her work with the library grew, so too were the demands of reality against her idealism. Coolidge believed that music needed to be accessible, hence her revulsion at charging for tickets, even a nominal fee. For the 1928-29 season, the free tickets became 25 cents a pop. It's like less than $5 in today's money. She hated this move on principle, but Engel felt it was necessary to help deal with the problems they were facing. She wanted the best contemporary composers, while Engel, as an employee of the federal government, preferred American composers. The biggest concern, though, was about the reach of these concerts. The same crowd typically showed up, and most of them they could actually afford a ticket. The idea of outreach and accessibility was nice and all, but in Engel's estimation, very few who would have benefited took advantage of the fact that these concerts were free. Coolidge was also an early musicologist. In 1896, decades before the first chair of musicology was founded at any American university, she had done a massive research project into the evolution of dance and music, 
and hoped to use part of her fortune for the furthering of musical research, including talks from eminent scholars. The latter didn't become a regular thing for the Library of Congress due to there not being too many esteemed figures in the field, and a scholarship that she started to further the study of budding musicologists ended up pretty much getting cut as soon as it got off the ground because there was a lack of students to give it to. Coolidge was a force of personality who had a knack for getting her way no matter how long it took, and she always was thinking about the next big project before the current one had even come to fruition. Conversely, her frequent changes of direction on the small details of a particular day or plan could grate on her guests, and it led some potential collaborators to regard her as kind of a loose cannon before they got to know her. The Bridges, Frank and Ethel, initially found Coolidge domineering and annoying, but slowly warmed to her as her devotion to Frank and his work, personally and financially, never faltered. He dedicated several major works of his maturity, including two of his string quartets, to her. In the 1920s, she looked more and more to Europe. If Engel was going to drag his feet about playing European works at the library, she could just take the show on the road. Hans Kindler, who had premiered Bloch's Cello Concerto Shlomo on extremely short notice, acted as the general manager of the European tour, and arranged for Coolidge to commission some of Europe's biggest names. He was attuned to European attitudes and knew who to commission so that programs would work well in prominent cities. Her favorite Englishman wouldn't play well in Berlin, for instance. Maurice Ravel came through with the piece after annoying her for being late and then asking more as a performance fee. Schoenberg, too, was skeptical about her standard and very generous $1,000 offer. Again, something like $30,000 today. Eventually, though he was contractually prevented from turning his manuscript over to the Library of Congress, he produced his third string quartet on a Coolidge commission, and later, his fourth. Coolidge has a reputation as a conservative in her tastes, and when you look at some of her closest composer friends, their creative impulses did tend towards the conservative, more romantic tradition. But this attitude does not show in her commissions. In fact, she tried to commission all three members of the Second Viennese School. Coolidge wanted a new wind quintet from Anton Webern, who was a very slow worker and already working on a string quartet. So through some back channels, the commission was altered to a quartet. This helped Webern in his precarious financial position, unwilling as he was to sway from his 12-tone methodology to appease the Nazis' cultural edicts. Webern's reputation for short and difficult-to-grasp music far outlived him, but her biggest criticism of his completed piece was that it was too short. I mean, as a Webern lady, I don't know what you're expecting. Coolidge attempted to commission Alban Berg to complete her second Viennese school trifecta, but Berg was too deep in the woods on his second and final opera, Lulu, and declined the commission, even though a yes would have been the best thing for his wallet. Schoenberg was helping his one-time people shop the score to his first opera, Wozzeck, in order to help make his budget balanced, and Coolidge offered to buy it when the library didn't come up with the funds. So instead of a Berg quartet, Coolidge commissioned Bela Bartok's Fifth Quartet, another composer in the financial pits and who could have used the money. She also had the privilege of commissioning the first quartet of Sergei Prokofiev, no small feat considering the Soviet bad boy's status both at home and abroad. She famously did not understand Ives' music. She knew Charles through his wife, Harmony Twitchell, daughter of the Reverend Joe and something of an adopted daughter of Albert and Nan. Charlie was independently wealthy, so he didn't need her money, but she certainly had a lot of connections. So if she'd taken a liking to some of his works, the story of his entry into the canon might be a bit different. While she had a soft spot for her Englishman, her true European love was Italy, and her closest Italian musical compatriot was Gian Francesco Malapiero, whose work at the Conservatory in Parma prevented him from his dream project, editing the complete works of his musical idol, Claudio Monteverdi. Coolidge's solution was to pay, up front, for 33 copies of the final edition, 32 of which she had donated to various libraries, as well as sending checks on the feast days of Saints Francis and Elizabeth, only stopping when fascist Italy got a little too colonial in Africa and she didn't want any part of her money going towards that effort. With the rising specter of war and fascism in its varied forms ascendant on the continent, her tours of Europe came to an end, and she became an instrumental force in helping refugees of fascism find firm footing in the United States. She did a lot of this stuff behind the scenes. I'll just give you one example. Darius Mio, 
Fleeing the fall of France, landed at his stateside teaching post at Mills College through Coolidge putting in a good word and footing some of the salary. She had taken composition lessons with Domenico Brescia, who had also conveniently just died, leaving the door open for the much more famous Mio to succeed him at his Mills College professorship. The Great Depression hit everyone. Coolidge had a financial cushion but had to trim the fat in order to keep her most pressing projects up and running. She had invested in Chicago's municipal bonds, and when the city defaulted, she was out of money and felt betrayed by the incompetent bureaucrats who had driven her city into the fiscal ground on the cusp of hosting the World's Fair. Her budgetary prowess allowed her to navigate the economy so long as she kept her purse strings tightened to any newcomers, such as Mary Howe, who was trying to put together a national symphony orchestra and only got a pittance from Coolidge after bothering her for literally years. Coolidge had long made it clear she was a patron of chamber music, not orchestral music. When Engel left full-time for Shermer's publishing firm in 1934, having split his time between the two jobs for some years, he was succeeded by a very green Oliver Strunk, who proved too incompetent for the exacting Coolidge, who had him ousted after three years on the job, whereupon he went to New York and cried about it to Engel for three hours. Oh, did I say three? Sorry. It was twelve hours. Back in western Massachusetts, the residents of her old haunts thought she'd abandoned them for greener pastures in Washington. She believed in the value of music everywhere, including there, but was too busy to effectively manage everything. Cellist Willem Willeke had been left in charge of the Temple of Music and its surrounding environment, and in Coolidge's absence began charging one-dollar admission fees to cover the basic costs of upkeep which she disliked, but given the circumstances, this move wasn't just understandable, it was absolutely the right thing to do. Her solution was to step back in on the artistic side and leave Willicky just to handle the maintenance. Dissension in the ranks of the folks at South Mountain dismayed an aging Coolidge. She read voraciously, was always doing composition studies with somebody somewhere, and practiced up to six hours a day, all with many low-level health problems that nagged at her through most of her life. One gets the sense that if she had ever stopped, she never could have gotten herself back going again. Her dedication to her goals, her vast network, and especially her willingness to spend whatever of her fortune that it took, meant that she achieved most of her professional patronage goals, with the exception of A, founding a national, publicly funded conservatory and orchestra in Washington, and B, helping create a cabinet-level position for the arts. We could honestly just be here all week naming people and institutions who got checks with her name on them. Out on the West Coast, Mills College always had her heart. She even lived on campus during the summers because she credited the Californian weather for improvements in her steadily declining hearing. Mills was the focal point of her West Coast giving, which included Claremont, USC, UCLA, and the public library. But the small institution felt threatened when, after she befriended former First Lady Lou Henry Hoover, Coolidge sought to sponsor musical activity at Mrs. Hoover's alma mater, Stanford, an institution that, to this day, houses a conservative think tank named for her presidential husband. Once again, grand visions and plans involved negotiating around the politics of people, ensembles, and institutions, around egos. Trying to make everyone happy was an exercise in cat herding that she described as trying to add two and two to make five. Where others thought about their students, their careers, their institutions, Coolidge thought only about art, how to make more of it, and how to make it better. Easier said than done. Elizabeth's energy was undimmed, and her mind sharp as ever, until a brief bout with pneumonia did her in on November 4th, 1953. Her lack of support for women in composition, a sore spot to modern onlookers, is an opportunity for insight into the gender politics of the day. Amy Beach was the first composer of note to give her music attention, and Coolidge certainly knew of far more than just herself, Beach, Mary Howe, and Rebecca Clark. She knew a who's who of female performers, and she had a number of close women musician friends. The relative lack of women in music, paired with Coolidge's insistence on quality with a preference for European composers, and likely more than a touch of 19th century gender roles, all play their parts. I suspect this focus is because she was a woman, 
So the assumption is that she ought to have done more for gender equality. But I think this is unfair because I don't think she'd be criticized in this realm nearly as much, if at all, if she were a man. Prejudice of any stripe was utterly out of character for her, so her lack of support for women in composition is reflective in very large part of the vast gender inequality present in the field as a whole. Underpinning this critique is an explicit acknowledgement that her money and her influence changed the nature of American music and what it meant to be an American artist on the international stage. Her choices of who to fund and who to commission gave rise to some duds, sure, but also some masterpieces of classical music across styles from the second Viennese school to Aaron Copland's celebrated Appalachian Spring. Whether she liked something and whether she considered it music were totally different ballgames. She disliked Roy Harris's style, but she still commissioned him. The theremin, on the other hand, bewildered her. Such was the advantage of having a hearing aid. She could just flip it off if she didn't like something. In her New York Times obituary, music critic Olin Downs shared his opinion that music itself experienced an incalculable gain and a new creative impulse in its cultivation in America, especially in the field of chamber music, which has no parallel in the modern period on either side of the Atlantic through exceptionally sagacious and enlightened patronage. From 1916 until 1941, she wrote $442,346.23 in checks, somewhere around $8.1 million in today's money. And yet at best, she said, Somewhere between a fifth and a quarter of the money she spent went to projects that were actually worthwhile. Patronage, like baseball, is a game of failure. But that does not mean that the game isn't worth playing. Mm -hmm.